Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and this is the next part of my Geiger Counters 101 video series. Today I'm explaining beta particles. If you recall I've already given you some information about how to use a Geiger Counter. In the previous part I talked to you about alpha emissions, alpha particles, alpha emitters. The part following this, which will come out in perhaps a week or two, will talk about gamma particles. Well, they're sort of particles, they're sort of waves. We'll talk about gamma emissions and it will talk about x-rays and cosmic rays as well. Today's subject is only beta, only beta radiation. Let me tell you what a beta particle is. When you have an atom, at its most basic, an atom generally has a proton and a neutron. These create, these, uh, the, these are the nucleus of the atom, the center part of the atom, the, the core of the atom. The number of protons tells you, of course, what type of atom you have, regardless of how many neutrons. If you have more neutrons than you should, more than what is stable for that particular atom, then you have an isotope of the atom. It's like the atom, but a little bit different. Typically, the number of electrons moving around the outside of the atom, electron, is equal to the number of protons. Typically, but not always. Now, a beta particle is a high energy energetic electron. There's actually a couple other things that fall under what a beta particle is, but I'll tell you those in just a minute. This is the basic. In an atom that has perhaps, let's say, too many neutrons, here are three neutrons and only one proton. An atom is capable of changing a neutron into a proton. This can happen. When this occurs and this neutron becomes a proton, it loses mass. Protons have less mass than a neutron. Energy is never destroyed. It is only changed. So where does that energy go? Sometimes it's emitted as a gamma ray. That's perfectly possible. But typically an electron is emitted. A high energy electron. That electron is a beta emission. The method by which this happens was detailed heavily and understood a hundred years ago. A neutron is actually a particle made up of three smaller particles. Three quarks is what makes up a neutron. Same as a proton, also three quarks. There are a family of particles that are made of quarks. So what you call a neutron is actually three particles. In the same way what you call an atom is made up of a proton, a neutron, and an electron, which you could also call it an atom, three quarks in the correct configuration could be called a proton or a neutron, depending on the configuration. And that's what we call them, neutron or proton. In the case of a neutron, you have, and I should point out that these are arbitrary names, up, down, top, bottom, strange, charm, those are the six names, that are arbitrary. That means that somebody just randomly came up with the name of them when they were working on them. They're not indicative of anything. A top quark is not somehow higher up than a bottom quark. It's just the name. A neutron is composed of one up quark and two down quarks. A proton is composed of one up quark, a second up quark, and a down quark. So the difference between these two is really that this has an extra, th this has two downs and an up, this has two ups and a down. Pretty simple, right? If you could take one of these downs and flip it to an up, you'd have a proton. That's what happens. This up moves here. Nothing really moves, the, atom, uh, the particle just changes. But during the transition from this to this, you have up to up, down to down, but here's where it gets weird. And let me draw this a little differently to make it simpler for you to see. I will draw this as up, uh, uh, up, down, up. It's the same as what I just drew a minute ago. Up, down, down. This way when I draw them, they match up. This is the same as what I drew a second ago. One up, two downs, two ups, one down. These guys move and switch. This guy doesn't, though.
here's what happens. This up, I'm sorry, this down changes to an up. When this down changes to an up, it has to release energy, and it does that. That energy is released as a virtual particle, a particle that doesn't really exist exactly. It does and it doesn't. It's not really there long enough. And in this case, it's a boson particle, a family of particles that convey things, if you like. It's called a, vir uh, it's called a virtual W uh, uh, negative boson. And this is not very important for understanding this in too much detail, but just to understand this is what happens. And what comes out of it is an energetic electron. Very powerful, very fast. Additionally, an anti-neutrino is produced. See these little guys? So that turns into that by releasing that. Let me draw this a little differently, because this is very important to understanding what a beta particle is. Towards the end of this video, I will show you actual beta sources that tick. In fact, one that puts out thousands of counts per minute. I'll show it to you. It'll be neat. But you should understand the math and the science a little bit first. Not too much math, not too much science. Just a little bit. When you're a proton, which is cre uh, the result of two, da uh, two downs and one up, When you're a neutron, pardon me, which is a result of two downs and an up, when this down switches to an up, it releases energy as a virtual W boson particle. This is showing you the same thing again. But this evaporates and splits off into the high-powered electron and this little anti-neutrino. This is all that's happening. Remember, mass and energy. Mass becomes energy, energy becomes mass. You get the idea. This energy becomes mass. Now, these guys here are from a family of particles, too. So this is a family. This is a family. These guys are a family. They're all different families of particles. They have different characteristics. Four different quantum numbers, that sort of thing. That's probably beyond the scope of this, so I won't go into it. But just, you should probably know this is a boson particle. It conveys force. In this case, the weak nuclear force. These guys right here are fermions. Well, this whole thing's a fermion. These little guys are called quarks. And they are, are held together by the strong nuclear force. And these little guys here are from a family called leptons. You have taus, muons, and electrons that are in the family of leptons. Recently, CERN laboratories detected this very type of particle right here moving they think possibly faster than the speed of light, although time will tell what that actually turned out to be. The other type of emission that can occur is a positron emission. In a positron emission, this is not negative, positive. This is an anti-electron. A positron is an anti-electron. Now, why do we call an anti-proton and a proton? Why do we call them like that? Why do we call a neutron an anti-neutron, but we don't call it an electron and an anti-electron? The reason is historical. The anti-electron was discovered at a particular time before they were doing that, and they called it a positron, meaning positive electron. When a positive electron, a positron, is created, instead of having an anti-neutrino, it gets a positive neutrino. Something just kind of interesting for you to understand and keep in your mind. Beta emissions occur several ways. One of them is the one I just mentioned to you a moment ago, and that was called beta-negative decay. Electrons, when you have a nucleus to an atom with protons and neutrons and you have a couple electrons flowing around it, electrons can also spiral into the core to emit gamma rays and other random things as well. Now that is sort of a form of beta radiation, but not quite. That actually falls under gamma radiation, so I'll discuss it more in the next video. But it's something to keep in mind. It is also possible for an atom to emit an electron from one of its shells that is a beta particle. It is possible, although it's not really very common. Such a thing would only happen if an atom was struck by a very energetic particle. That's something called spalling, although that's a very uncommon form of spalling as well. Energetic beta particles can also be produced by people. In a cyclotron, for example, which is a device that accelerates electrons. In fact, your TV produces a beams of electrons. Those beams of electrons are similar to beta emissions, but they're lower energy. 
the symbol for a beta particle is this B, beta. In fact, if you're in Europe or any other place, they usually call it beta, not beta. Beta is the American way of saying it. And this is a Greek B. Betas come in beta minus, beta plus, and even a rare form called double beta, in which two beta particles are simultaneously released, although this is very hard to observe because it's very, very uncommon. Beta particles are significantly more penetrating than alpha particles. And I remind you guys, I'll be showing you radioactive substances at the end of this video. Let me give you an example. Here is a sheet of paper. Here is a block of aluminum. a block of aluminum. Here is a block of lead. Alpha emitter, beta emitter. We haven't gotten into gammas, but I'll just show them. Gamma emitter. Alpha particles are stopped by the paper. I showed you this in my last video when I took a powerful alpha emitter, polonium-210, and I put a piece of paper in front of it and remember it blocked it. Thin paper like coffee filter paper, it could still get through. But all regular paper blocked it. Any of these other ones would block it as well. The beta particle goes right through the paper. Right through it like it's not there. It will even go through several layers of your skin, which is why it's dangerous. All of these are dangerous when they get into your body. Right? Very dangerous. But alpha is not very dangerous on the outside. You could probably hold a big chunk of polonium in your hand without getting too many, too many troubles because the alpha particles wouldn't go into your hand. Of course, the polonium itself can absorb into your hand, which would then kill you, but that's a different issue entirely. Betas can go through the paper, cardboard, thin pieces of wood. They can go a couple hundred centimeters in air, like three, four, five, six feet even, through air. The, far, the distance they can go is proportionate to how thick something is, how dense it is, rather, and also uh, how much energy they have. So if they're very energetic, they can go farther. They are stopped when they hit a couple millimeters of lead. It takes two or three millimeters of lead to stop most, uh, most beta particles. If, however, they made it through the aluminum, if it were thin enough, they would definitely stop when they hit the lead. But usually a piece of aluminum will stop them. Just to point out, by c comparison, gamma will penetrate the paper and the aluminum like they weren't even there. It takes an inch or more of lead to fully stop gamma. That should give you an idea of the penetrative powers of beta versus gamma versus alpha. Now when you were detecting a source, perhaps this rock, and you want to know if it's radioactive or not, and you determine it is radioactive, you can use this simple knowledge to determine what the cause is. If, for example, let me erase this, we should invest in an eraser, right? If you take your rock, here's your rock, and here's your probe, tick, 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 you're detecting radiation. You detect 100 counts per minute. You run a 10, 15 minute average. Remember, I said always run a few minutes of average, 10, 15, divided by the number of minutes. You have an average. You have an average of 100 counts per minute. Here's how you determine. This minus your background. Let us say that you have determined that your background is 20 counts per minute. In the same way you tested the item, you ran your Geiger counter, like this Geiger counter, for an hour. You took the readings and divided them by 60. Then you would know how many counts per minute is your average. Let us say 20 is your average. That tells us that we're getting 80 counts per minute on average from the specimen. Now, take the piece of paper. Hold the piece of paper in front of the object, put the Geiger counter over top of it. What is the change? If there's no change at all, then you're either being uh, bombarded by beta or gamma, no alpha. But let's say there's a change. 
you use the paper minus there's a 10 count per minute change. 10 counts per minute disappeared. We only got 70 counts per minute when we put the paper in front of it. 70 CPM. By knowing this, we know that 10 counts per minute is alpha. And let me clear out my math a little bit here. Let's clear this out and write it a little easier to understand more easily. 100 counts to start with minus back ground equals 80. Therefore, three dots mean therefore, therefore 20, therefore 80 counts per minute comes from the rock. We took the 80 CPM, we used a piece of paper and we found that we got 70, so minus 70 equals 10, 10 CPM is alpha. We take that 70 counts per minute CPM, we put a sheet of aluminum in front of it, a thick sheet of aluminum, perhaps a, a millimeter thick, and we discover that we only get 50 counts per minute above background. This is, these are above background amounts. Minus that 50, that means 20 of that was beta, and now the remainder that's left over, the remaining 50 counts per minute, is gamma. So using that method, we're able to determine what's going on. You take gross counts minus background. You do what you need to shield it from alpha, see what changed. That's how much alpha. You do what you need to shield the remainder of that from, be from beta, what changed? That's how much beta there was. Whatever's left over is gamma. <sighs> this is not the most scientific approach in the world, but when you're just standing out in the field somewhere and you want to take a guess as to what a rock is producing, that's how you would do it. Without any prior knowledge. Without any intuition. Now there are a few things to consider with beta. For example, as a, uh, when you have little atoms, here's the nucleus, here's an electron, here's a nucleus, here's an electron, we draw a couple atoms. Okay? Now let me draw a big atom. Here's a big, big atom. It has many electrons around it. When the beta particle moves along, it is negatively charged and it attenuates as it passes the atoms. They attract it or they repel it, depending on how much electrical activity they have. If they're very negative, they repel it. If they're very positive, they attract it. See? This one attracts it. This one repels it. This one attracts it. This one pulls it in and zooms it off that way. As you're changing the momentum of this electron, if you do it fast enough, you can actually emit a gamma ray. This is called Brumstellung, which I can't pronounce, of course, because I'm not German. I think you have to be German to pronounce Brumstellung. But it basically means radiation breaking. When you take an electron and slow it down fast enough, the energy is fast enough. If the change in momentum is quick enough, the energy, the, the surplus energy left over, can become a gamma ray. And that gamma ray will then zoom off. The, the reason I mention this to you is if you have a beta emitter, let us say that this was a beta emitter, and you block it with lead, the lead stops those uh, beta emissions way too well, way too, efficient, uh, too efficiently. The result is it will actually stop all the beta, but then produce gamma as a result of it. That's not good. What you want to do is you want to use a light element to block alphas and, and betas, because they both have this effect. Anything whose atomic weight is less than 26 usually works out pretty well. Not always, but usually. What that means is that aluminum is usually the highest level of, uh, of material that you want to use. If you remember the um, elemental ch uh, chart with all the elements on it, fine aluminum, anything less than aluminum is good. Including aluminum, of course. Aluminum is inclusive. And keep in mind, um, these particles can even change that material given time.
like for example, technically, if an alpha emitter is put in front of aluminum, it will slowly turn that aluminum into phosphorus. Isn't that interesting? Now, of course, the change is very, very gradual. You'd probably almost never be able to actually detect it. But consider that these things are actually changing their environment around them. That's how powerful they are. One little bit of mathematical stuff before we look at the readings and, and talk to you about them. When converting an absorbed dose into an equivalent dose, for example, one gray of beta is equal to one uh, sievert. I always misspell sievert. So if I've misspelled sievert, don't bug me about it, of beta. The reason is the quality factor of the radiation is 1, same as gamma. If you recall from my previous uh, uh, video, alpha has a quality factor of 20. That means that it is 20 times. So 1 gray of alpha would be equal to 20 sieverts of, of, of uh, alpha. Whereas 1 gray of, of beta is equal to 1, gray, uh, one sievert of beta. And the reason is effective dose is equal to absorbed dose multiplied by quality factor. In this case, quality factor is a 1. Keep that in mind. Now, I think it is about time that we look at some sources, because we like things that tick. Remember, proper precautions always. Beta radiation is relatively commonplace and can be observed in our everyday normal lives. One of the most common beta emitters that we find would be light salt, potassium chloride salt. Here are two examples of it. These beta emitters are perfectly normal and perfectly safe as well. To give you an example, when you pour out the contents of a package like this, you end up with a bag of salt. This salt is a, is a salt of potassium and chlorine put together. All potassium contains a naturally occurring isotope, which is the same as a regular potassium atom in the, in the number of protons, but it has an additional neutron, or less than the number of neutrons. That's what makes it an isotope. Potassium-40 is an unstable version of potassium and it exists in a tiny percentage of all regular potassium, so that means that all regular potassium contains small amounts of this radioactive substance. Let us cut the Geiger counter on so we can hear the sound, and let us take the Geiger counter out and detect this beta. We have gone from 30, 35 to 40 counts per minute, well in excess of 100. With the shield removed, we will detect even more. This bag has been fully cleaned to ensure no contamination occurs on the probe, which is very important. The contaminated probe is not very useful. We have already hit over 400 counts a minute, propping this up to where it can be seen. We are over 450 counts per minute already. Now, let me cut the sound off. Each one of these ticks that you're hearing is a detection of a beta, a beta particle emission from the potassium in the salt. They are striking the Geiger counter and completing a circuit, which is the tick that you hear. Beta radiation is, of course, more penetrating than regular alpha radiation, but it is less dangerous. To give you an example, no alpha emitters are generally considered safe to be around. Something like depression glass like this, which contains uranium, is emitting alpha particles, which cannot penetrate my hands. 
They cannot penetrate the dead skin on my hands. But if I were to ingest this alpha emitter, perhaps a powdered form of it, this would be incredibly deadly to my body. Incredibly deadly. Whereas, by whereas by uh, um, conver uh, whereas conversely, this beta emitter that comes out of this salt, I could pour some in my hand if I wanted to, and I could eat it. And it would not hurt me at all. In fact, the human body is naturally uh, full of potassium, and therefore, because potas radioactive potassium occurs with normal potassium, your body is also full of radioactive potassium. This is not dangerous to your body, potentially. The reality is that some cancers every year that occur in the world are as a result of natural potassium in the human body that's causing problems. But this cannot be avoided because the lack of potassium will kill you. Potassium is not particularly dangerous and is not usually considered particularly dangerous when held, even though it produces a half of a million electron volt beta particle, which is actually quite powerful. But the activity, the amount of beta emissions, is very low. This leads to the concept in Geiger counters of energy and frequency, rather activity, if you will. It's not just how much it occurs, or how much of it occurs, it's how often it occurs that matters as well. Very low energy but very high activity sources can sometimes be more deadly than very high energy but very low activity sources. Geiger counters are particularly good at detecting beta emissions. In fact, beta emissions are probably what the Geiger counter has the most efficiency at detecting. This Geiger counter you generally has a 50-60% efficiency at detecting most uh, beta emitters. Some are as low as 30%. It depends. Some are even lower. But by contrast, most gamma producing elements, the Geiger counter has perhaps a 1, 2, or 3% detection uh, efficiency. Meaning that for every 100 gammas, I might detect only 1 or 2. Whereas for every 100 betas, I might detect 40 or 50. Now let us discuss different types of beta emitters. There's obviously potassium, as I've already shown you. Uranium emits beta. The uranium decay series is long and complicated, having many different chains that it goes through. As one atom decays, it becomes a different type of atom if the number of protons in it changes. These various atoms produce various decays as a result of it. Some are alpha, some are beta, and some are gamma. Another common place emitter is tritium. This is the tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of tritium. And in the dark, we can see what that will do. And I'll show you in just a minute what this does in the dark. With the lights cut off, you can see the tritium. Here's the tritium. The red reflection you're seeing is coming from the camera. Do you see that? The green, however, is a phosphorus coating on the inside of this container that is being excited by tritium that is emitting very, very, very weak beta particles. Very weak. They can't even penetrate the outside of this container. I'll show you as I put it in front of the Geiger counter and you can see for yourself. Now with the lights on, let us move the uranium. Let us place this near here. And let's cut first the sound on. You can detect a little bit, but not very much. Much less than the light salt. Tritium just can't make it through the plastic. Tritium, by the way, in case you're unaware, is the third isotope of hydrogen. Sometimes known as hydrogen-3. By comparison, the uranium emits quite a lot more. But this is to be expected. And yet still, out of all of this, the potassium salt is emitting the most. Remember what I said. Never touch a probe to a sample 
unless of course you have a sample that has been cleaned and sealed like this. This glass is relatively auto sealed in, in so much as glass holds what's in it in it and has been recently cleaned and it has been swipe tested. This bag has been cleaned and swipe tested. Both of them basically you swipe a sample and you test to see if any radioactivity comes off. And technically I could touch this to it as well because it is also sealed. An unsealed sample would be inappropriate to touch to a Geiger counter. <clears throat> Beta emissions are one of the most common emissions, of course, that exist in nature. An example would be like this rock right here. Now, when handling rocks and other specimens, it is important to consider, if you would, wearing a glove. For this low-level sample I have, this is probably going a little overboard, but it's to give you an idea of what safe handling is. Also, I sealed this in a bag to prevent radon emissions. I also clean the bag out, letting it air outside before I bring it in. This little rock is a beta producer. It's probably also an alpha and gamma producer as well. It probably is either thorium or uranium. I still have not been able to determine which. But when you put it down, and then you put a Geiger counter near it, it picks it up quite fine. Now the simplest way to determine whether something is a beta emitter is to see if you can block it correctly or distance. If you exceed a few inches of distance and you're still getting readings, you're probably picking up something that is either, uh, either additional to alpha or not alpha at all, such as beta. Here's an example. From this distance I pick up readings. Not much, but there they are. If I put a piece of paper in between, I'm still picking up readings. If you recall from the, from the alpha particle video, this paper blocks alpha particles quite nicely. And so you know that there mustn't be, if there, if there is some alpha, you know that it must not be all of the radiation that exists inside of this rock. Otherwise, we'd be able to fully block it. Now to determine if it's gamma or not, the best method you can use is to use a material that would stop beta. This is kind of a rusty piece, but it's a piece of steel. This steel will block most beta. It's not very thick, but let's see what happens when we place it over top of the rock, and then we place the Geiger counter over top of that. we get very little. And so we can conclude that since gamma rays will pass through this metal most of the time, alpha will not, beta will not, that the majority of our emissions are beta. This is a simple test based on what I originally showed you about the penetrative powers of beta versus alpha versus gamma. Another proper handling technique where I'm handling something more dangerous than this small little piece of rock would be to put down a paper towel to place this upon instead of this table. The reality is this rock is not very dangerous at all. In fact, you could handle it safely without gloves. I'm just showing you the proper technique. Now, let us consider a stronger beta source. A beta source with significantly more power. Alright, we're going to handle a significantly more powerful source now. Most scientists would, would tell you that a small calibration source, like what I'm going to show you, is potentially very safe to hold. I, however, disagree because I don't believe that any amount of radiation is truly safe. Every piece of radiation carries risk. To give you an example right off the bat, I have 
0.1 microcurie of polonium-210, which is an alpha producer. You've seen this before if you've seen my videos. To cut the sound on, we turn over the alpha producer to expose the inner part of it. Remove the cap. Now, if you recall, the alpha producer is very, very powerful when you get close to it. We can easily, within seconds, easily hit several thousand counts per minute without touching it. However, a piece of paper fully blocks the source. Alpha attenuates so fast because it is heavily positively charged, so fast that it cannot be used for anything that doesn't involve just a few centimeters of distance. I've calculated the maximum range of this polonium source at 3.97 centimeters, which is not very far at all. We'll move the polonium aside. We're going to pull out something a little bit more powerful. This is strontium-90. Strontium-90 is a nearly pure beta emitter. It is contained in this aluminum shell. The aluminum shell blocks it totally. As a result of being inside of this aluminum, virtually no particle ever makes it out. Occasionally a gamma will come out because the progression of strontium-90 is strontium-90 decays by beta emission into yttrium-90, which decays by beta emission into zircon-90. The result of this is that each time it decays, a neutron turns into a proton. And each time a beta particle is emitted, and during the last trans, trans uh, during the last uh, beta emission, a gamma is occasionally emitted too, but it's very, very weak, and it may even be blocked by this aluminum, though that can't be said for sure. I take extreme caution when I use this, even though it is only a one-tenth of a microcurie source, a very small amount. But regardless, safety is number one. Now, drop the source off, put this down, and stand back. As you can see, even from a foot or two away, the emissions can be detected. They are mostly blocked by the side of the container, but if you move over top, powerful beam is produced. Up to 60,000 counts per minute with the Skyrim Hunter's ability to detect at about 30% efficiency. The reality is that this deca sample is decaying at 3,700 counts, if you like, 3,700 disintegrations per second, which would be 222,000 counts per minute. Now, you can tell the difference between the two. Let us move the alpha particle emitter over here. Move this out of the way. As I'm over top of the um, alpha, I mean over top of the alpha particle emitter, I don't detect anything until I just about touch it. And then it becomes very powerful. But at many feet above, you drop that down to the camera range, at many feet over top of the strontium, I can detect radiation. This is the nature of beta emissions. Now let us flip the, the strontium-90 over so that it is a little bit less problematic. Okay. As you can see now, that's the top of the container. It is now diminished. Oops, dropped my, my little hand gripper there. It is now diminished to a degree. 
from a distance of right here, what is this, a foot? I don't detect too much, a couple hundred counts. And a piece of steel will fully block this. As you see, that's why I used the steel earlier to determine the radioactivity. However, when I place a piece of paper over the strontium, no effect. Paper does nothing to stop it whatsoever. Various Geiger counters have various efficiencies at detecting. As you can see, this one has nowhere near the efficiency and the ability to detect is my large pancake tube. Now, strontium is a nasty little thing to handle, so let's put it away. Alrighty. Now let's close the top. Contain inside of its little container, it is effectively safe. I have run many hours of analysis on this containment unit and I see no change of anything getting out of it because it is exactly two and a half times as thick as would be required to stop this particle. And of course I don't worry too much about my alpha source. Beta is only somewhat deadly on the outside. It is much more deadly inside, just like alpha, just like the alpha particle. If I ingested beta, it could be lethal. Well, a very highly active beta emitter. But a low activity beta emitter, like the potassium salt, not so deadly. And from an external uh, exposure, like what I'm having right this moment, just a little bit from the outside, it's not very deadly at all because my skin blocks most of it. But I say, why take the chance? Anyhow, this is the nature of beta radiation. If you recall keynotes, beta particles are energetic electrons or positrons. They only have a few feet of distance they can travel through the air before they attenuate, before they get sucked up by an atom. They have many times more penetrative powers than alpha, but tremendously less penetrative powers than gamma. They are negatively or positively charged, depending on whether they are positrons or electrons. And the biggest, most common method of stopping them is to use something like aluminum. This has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Remember, always calibrate your Geiger counter and always be safe. Radioactive material is not something to play around with. Bye-bye.